It's no secret that we live in a celebrity-crazed culture. The well-known names of our decade influence everything, from how we spend our time in media to what brand of soap that we buy. And I guess it's just part of human nature. What gets dangerous for us as Christians is when that celebrity culture spills over into our churches and we become followers of one particular pastor or another. That just shouldn't be even when we've got great respect for them. And you know, the Apostle Paul spoke to the proper order. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Well, today in our study of the book of Amos, the country prophet, as we've come to know him, is a guy who overruled all celebrity in his day and spoke the truth directly to those who needed to hear it. And among other things, Amos helps us appreciate the faithfulness of those serving God in small places. Dr. McGee especially appreciated that, as he tells us in this special introduction to today's study. We've heard so much today, and I think all of us have a tendency to use it when some famous person, either on television or in politics or in athletics or in some other field or an astronaut, gets converted, my, we think that is great, don't we? But I think the real heroes are not those folk today. I think the real ones are these little people that are out yonder today that are working for God, and there's no one in the grandstand to applaud them. They are just doing it under the Lord. And here is a letter that reveals that. It comes from a little place in Oklahoma. And I lived in Oklahoma in a little place, and I know how little those places can be. Let me read just a few lines to let you know how much I appreciate and love you. You are a real inspiration to me. I thank God that I came to know many years ago, not you personally, not personally by radio. I was new in preaching and blessed to be in bigger churches, but felt God leading to small rural churches. God provide that I would be able to do this by a disability that took care of my living expense. So now I devote my work to small rural churches. They are about able to take care of expense to pastor them. Sometime it's a battle because Satan still tempts me to go to larger congregations because of the monetary difference, but still feel it's God's will and plan for me at the rural church. I think that's a very wonderful letter. And now here's some more little people. This letter comes from Athens, Alabama. It says, and I'm reading it now, it's quite interesting that the highlight of my day is to hear your broadcast. I say this because I'm 16 years old. This is the time of my life that I'm supposed to spend boozing it up and having all kinds of kicks of worldly activity. At least that is the norm at the high school I attend. I thank God he called me out of all that and has given me a much better life. As a Christian, I find contentment in the little things of life. I enjoy the steady progress of one moment at a time. Although I've been a Christian for almost three years, I'm uncertain of the exact date. I'm not the same person I was a year ago. I used to want glory and honor from everybody and often had great illusions of grandeur. Now I find contentment in being then it mentions his name. Let's just say Joe Dokes. Just in being Joe Dokes, I have gotten to know myself and know life better by giving up television and turning to the Word of God. That's marvelous from a 16-year-old boy. There's still hope, I guess, for the country. Let's pray for one another as we dive into God's Word. Father, thank you for the faithfulness of quiet obedience and the courage 
that you give us to stand for you. Please open our hearts now as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, I want today to back up just a little in chapter 1 because we're in this section where we have the judgment on the surrounding nations, the nations that were contiguous to the nation Israel. And this man, Amos, though he came from the country and he's a country preacher, he has a world view. And he is pronouncing, first of all, judgment upon these surrounding nations and for particular sins. He's very specific about the sins. Now, we mentioned before, the last one we dealt with was Ammon. The Ammonites lived across on the east bank of the Jordan River, actually uh, along the Dead Sea. In fact, they were in that particular area that began about the Dead Sea and moved up north. And their capital, we are told here in verse 14, I'll kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour its palaces. Now, this was a great city, and that city later on was called by the Greeks Philadelphia. It was named actually for Ptolemy Philadelphus of Egypt, and we know it today as Amman. It is the capital of Jordan. And the ruins are there of the great civilization that was there in the past. It's been totally destroyed. The fact of the matter is why the modern nation of Jordan is really built on the ruins of that nation of the Ammonites. And then south of it were the Moabites. The Moabites now in chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Moab and for four. And that is the prophet's way. And this man, Amos, I consider him a great preacher. They broke the mold after they made him. There's just one of him. He uses unusual expressions. He says, not for three and not for four. Well, how many? Well, he could list a great many. This is his way of saying There were many transgressions, but he's specific with each one. He says, I will turn away its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Now, that's a strange thing to say, is it not? The judgment against Moab is for injustice. In fact, for an awful spirit of revenge. After the man has been killed, the Edomites were their enemies, and after they had destroyed, that is, had got a victory over the Edomites and had killed the king, you'd think that would be it. But they even burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. That's carrying their revenge, that revengeful spirit, even farther than it should be carried. God says because of that. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it will devour the palaces of Kirioth, and Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the judge from the midst of it, and I will slay all its princes with him, saith the Lord. You notice God says here that Moab shall die with tumult. That is, They go out with a big bang, and that will end the nation. And it's interesting that this proud nation was brought to extinction by Nebuchadnezzar later on, and you haven't seen a Moabite since then. But isn't it interesting that out of this heathen country, there came that gentle, lovely, and beautiful girl by the name of Ruth that became the wife of Boaz, and it presents one of the loveliest books we have in the Bible, and she's in the line that leads to Jesus Christ. She's in that genealogy, by the way. And she came from Moab, of all places. They were really a heathen, pagan people with a sad and sorry beginning, and just as sad 
but tragic end as a nation. But it reveals the fact of what the grace of God can do in the life of a believer if the believer will let him do that. But here we have the fact that we're coming now to a people that should have done better but did not do better. Now, these are the messages against the surrounding nations, that is, those that were around Israel. Now he's going to take up God's people, but he begins with Judah, and the first is against the southern kingdom, and he came from down there. And verse 4, I'm reading now, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Judah, and for four I will turn away its punishment. Now, in other words, again, God could enumerate many for which they were guilty, but here is the chief one. Because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err after which their fathers have walked. Now, he says, but I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now, this is saying in a very brief way what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel took quite a few pages to say. That is, that God would judge the southern kingdom of Judah that went into Babylonian captivity, that he would judge it for what? They did not keep the commandments of God. They despised God's law. Now, Judah had the law of God and despised it. Temple was down in Jerusalem, and God now judges them according to the law. Have you noticed that God never judged any of these other nations on that basis whatsoever, that he judged them for certain specific sins they committed, sins that are common to mankind today that is in sin, but the other nations did not have God's law, and therefore they were not judged according to God's law. And he says here, I will send a fire upon Judah, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now, you will find that again and again, he mentions as the other prophets do, the fact that there is to be a judgment by fire. And you'll find that running actually not only through this prophecy, but you find it running through the other prophets. And when Nebuchadnezzar came, he burned Jerusalem to the ground, absolutely burned it. Nothing left but the stones that were there. And of course, there were plenty of stones in that particular place. Now, that is something that he's delivering now. That is, Amos is delivering up in Bethel, and he's speaking in the king's chapel. Now, I think that probably every time he got up to speak, he'd take up one of these nations, and he would pronounce God's judgment upon it, but he gets now to Judah, And that's getting pretty close to home. Maybe a few squirmed in their pew when he mentioned Judah. But after all, the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes were at war a great deal of the time. There were several times when they made alliances, but they only made them because of fear and of necessity to stand against a common enemy. But most of the time, why they were enemies. And therefore, when Amos gave his message of judgment against the southern kingdom, everyone was present and amened him for that because they were in agreement that God should judge Jerusalem and Judah. But now the northern kingdom, what about the northern kingdom? Now he's going to speak to them. And beginning here with verse 6, he's speaking to the northern kingdom. And Bethel, Bethel, if you want it pronounced that way, Bethel is the capital, and the king was there, and this man was speaking in the king's chapel. We are told that later on. We've already seen that. And now he's going to start meddling. He's getting close at hand. 
It's like the old story that we heard about the preacher one Sunday morning was preaching about different sins of drinking and this woman sitting in a congregation, she amened him and preached about the sin of smoking and she amened him for that and for the sin of cussing and she amened him for that. And finally he got around, he began to talk about gossiping and she says, he started meddling now. And friends, Amos is starting to meddle now. He's going to talk about his congregation that's before him now. It's not going to be the sins of the Moabites. This is the sin of the northern kingdom. They too had God's law. They had the commandments of God. They had the word of God. Now listen to him as he speaks in verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, and may I say to you, I personally have never felt that I have any right to stand in the pulpit and speak unless I can speak on the basis of thus saith the Lord. My feeling is that that's the basis of all ministry. What does the Word of God have to say? Thus saith the Lord. Now listen to him here. For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I'll not turn away its punishment. But there are more than that, and believe me, he mentions more than that. Now he's going to deal actually with the Mosaic law. He's not dealing here with the commandments as he did with Judah, but he's dealing with these commandments that have to do with a man's everyday life. Now, first of all, he says, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. Now, the interesting thing is that a great deal is said here about the poor. The 10 tribes in the north now, they had the law, but they were committing the sins of the nations that were round about them. Fact of the matter is, we'll see that the very people that God put out of that land, why, they were committing the same sins. Now, first of all, you have here the mistreatment of the poor. And you'll find out that he has a great deal to say about the poor. If you turn over to the fourth chapter, verse 1, Hear the word, ye cows of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor who crush the needy. And then again in chapter 5 and verse 11, and will you listen to this? For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor. Now I've called attention to this time and again in the prophets that the poor are not going to get justice, nor will they be treated fair on this earth until Christ reigns. The only hope of the poor is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry to say that, but we are told today that certain political parties will take care of the poor. Well, they've been taking care of us, all right, friends. Every time another one comes along and tells how much he's going to help me, I listen to him, and then my taxes go up. And they've been going up and up and up. And i be very frank with you. I find out that most of these men are rich men. We have too many rich men, not just lawyers today in Congress. We have too many millionaires there, and they don't know my problem. They don't understand me. They don't understand the poor, and I'm thankful as one someday that's going to take over for the poor. Now, God will judge a nation for its mistreatment of the poor. Now, somebody says, well, was there any law on this? There certainly was. Let me read you just one, and I could give several. In verse 19 of chapter 16 of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 16, 19, listen to this. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert the words of the righteous. God put this law to protect the poor. 
In that day, a man might be absolutely innocent, but his adversary would slip something under the table to the judge. And by the way, that practice doesn't seem to be out of style today. Styles change, but not this one. That thing is still done. And it's difficult today for the poor, you see, to get justice when money today seems to be the determining factor. May I say to you, this man is speaking to a very pertinent problem of his day. And even a pair of shoes would pervert judgment and cause the poor to have to suffer. And then, not only that, by the way, but I come down here to verse 7, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. And what does that mean? Well, it could mean several things. Personally, I think it means that these selfish, these greedy judges and rich even resented that the poor had enough dust left to throw on their heads in mourning. Believe me, that is the modern idolatry also. That is covetousness today. And we see a great deal of that about. And God judges nations for that that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. And apparently he's talking about a maid that's a prostitute. And both the father and the son went in to them. And God says that adultery profanes his holy name. May I say to you, the new morality today wasn't new at all. Israel was practicing the new morality, but God said that he hated it, and he had put down laws specifically concerning this type of thing, and they were breaking over these. You can see this preacher's not going to be popular, friends. Amos was not really a very popular preacher in his day. He took the side of the poor and he condemned unrighteousness. He condemned the injustice. He condemned the fact that the poor were getting a bad deal, and he condemned immorality. Not only that, listen to him. He's not through. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And did you know that God had a very lovely law in that particular connection. I think I have time to turn and read that. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 12, listen to this. And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. Now, a man very poor, he had nothing to put up, you know, for a very small loan as collateral, except his outer garment, and that's what he needed to keep him warm. God says, you can take it, but when the sun goes down, you let him have it back in order that he might not be cold and sleeping that night. Now, God says, you've been breaking over at that point. You have disobeyed me. And as a result, he says, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. And this is by every altar. I should mention that, which means there was only one altar that God had established in Jerusalem in the temple. This speaks of they had turned to idolatry and now he's condemning drunkenness. Now, we're coming back to drunkenness again, and I'll not enlarge on that today at all. But these are the sins that God said in verse 9, yet destroyed I the Amorite before them. They did the same thing. Now, God is saying to his people, do you think you can get by with it? Well, we'll see that next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. We see from the perspective of history how God destroyed the Amorites for the same sins that the Israelites were committing. And then we also know from history that Israel was led into captivity in 722 B.C., as predicted by Amos. Is there a lesson for us in that? 
Well, you can be sure of it. Why don't you hop aboard the Bible bus on Monday to learn more from Dr. McGee. Now, to help you get the most out of our time together in God's Word, we want you to have Dr. McGee's free notes and outlines. Now, we've put together all of them for our five-year journey into one downloadable ebook. You can download yours for free when you visit us at ttb.org forward slash briefing the Bible. Or if you'd prefer to have an abbreviated paperback copy sent by mail for free, please call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Again, that number is 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll meet you back here on Monday as we continue our exciting journey through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?